and amen. Pastor. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. Good morning, church. We're going to need to wake up a little bit for this one. Is that okay? I said, is that okay, church? You guys awake today? We're going to open the Word of God today. That's exciting, amen? amen. Uh, it's wonderful to be together to worship God today. And, uh, and here at Christian Life Fellowship, I know we say this every week, but I think we need to remember this. We're going to open the Bible today. We believe in the Bible. And today we're going to open it like we do every week. And I think it's important, too, for us to remember something in our time. And you might have heard this some other places, but I think it's important we say it here. Church is essential. Church is essential. We need to gather together. We believe in the authority of the word of God. We believe that it's divinely inspired by God. Peter tells us, the apostle, that God moved men by the Holy Spirit, and through this book, he speaks to us today. Do you want to hear the voice of God today? I know I do. I know I need to. That's good news in a dark world, isn't it, church, that God would choose to speak to us, that he would choose to reveal himself to us, that he would choose to show us what he's like. His word guides our Christian faith and practice, and that includes things like we just talked about, like our need for church community, like our need for each other. Even in times of great uncertainty, his word is our anchor. The the psalmist David in his wonderful, long psalm, Psalm 119, he is just talking so much about the word of God and how important it is. And, and I think what's the culmination of it? He says, the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Do you sometimes like me feel like the path's a little dark right now? His word's the light. We need to open it. We need to read it. In Acts 2, the church gathered around the apostles' doctrine. It says, the word of of God, and today, 2,000 years later, we continue in not only what is a church tradition, but is a mandate from God on high. A mandate to gather as a Christian community around the word of God. The mandate is found in Hebrews 10.25. It says this, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but let us exhort one another, especially as you see the day approaching. See, church is essential. The word of God is essential. And God tells us this, I think, because there's power in the worshiping of the saints together. There's encouragement in having a time to look forward to. A time for our church community to gather each week. There's something about gathering together that breaks the bondage of depression. Amen? Amen. As we gather, it resets our hearts and it reminds us that we're not alone. Do you know that you're not alone today? Look around you. God's placed us together to be light in this dark time, to lift each other up. When a brother or sister struggle in with darkness, we need to shine the light into their life, amen. amen. We're in this together, we're not alone. And I don't know about you, but as we worship on Sundays, it builds my faith. Amen. Something happens in the spiritual realm. Listen, something happens in the spiritual realm as we praise God, do you believe that today? Something does happen. That bondage does break. Those sin barriers are broken down. Worship is powerful. Worship is a weapon. And people come against gathering for worship today. And I think that's because the enemy doesn't like what takes place. Do you know we have opposition in this spiritual battle? Satan and his demons, they want to stop what breaks the yoke of bondage. They want to stop us from putting on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Have you felt heaviness lately? We need those garments of praise. 
When we worship together, something happens. Bondage breaks, wounds are healed, chains are broken, lives are set free. You awake, church. Have you been set free today? People's hearts are open to receive the message of the gospel as we pray. You see, we need each other. We need to worship together. We need to hear the word of God declared as we meet together. You ever feel like quitting? We need each other as we run this race. We need our brothers and sisters to pick us up when we're down. Church, listen, the, the, when the world is crazy out there, you don't have to walk out far outside your door to see that the world is crazy out there. When it's crazy out there, there's peace and life in here. Amen. Amen. Do you believe it? Yes. I said, do you believe it? Yes. There's peace and light in here. We need that reminder on a weekly basis. Yeah. I've needed that reminder this year. Have you? Yeah. <clears throat> the word of God and the gathering of saints is so important no matter what the world tells us. So in this important moment, as we gather around the word of God, as we open the word of God as a family, I want to start by contemplating a question. And I want you to know that I asked myself the same question today, but I think it's what the Holy Spirit would ask of his church today. In the midst of all that's happening around us, in the midst of great chaos and uncertainty, I want to ask this. Where is your focus? Where is our focus? I ask myself, where is my focus? And Webster's Dictionary defines focus as this. A central point or point of concentration. Listen to that again. A central point point or a point of concentration. So as we open the word of God today, I want us to really contemplate this. Would you think about this? What is the central point that our heart and mind is turned towards? What is our central place where we put our concentration I think if we're honest, we can admit that particularly this year, there are a lot of things that have been calling for our attention. You ever feel like me that things this year are just always coming at you? Your phone is always ringing. There's always notifications. There's always something to review. You turn on your TV, you pick up your phone, you go on your computer, things come at you constantly that demand your attention. I ask again, where is our attention in the midst of all of this? So as we open the scriptures today, I realize this, this one thing, that the reality is, is that the last nine to ten months have been tremendously hard for many people. I talk to people all across this country every day for my job, and the constant theme, and you might relate, the constant theme as I talk to them, as we approach the holidays, as we start to get ready to celebrate Christmas, as we get ready for the new year, I hear phrases like this all the time. Let's get this year over with. Bring on that new year. Let's Put 2020 behind us and let's move to 2021, right? It's a constant theme. From New York to California, when I talk to customers or people that I do business with, that's the theme. Maybe you can relate. And particularly as Christians, the pressure has certainly increased this year. In our nation, it's, it's grown deeper. It's grown more difficult. Many in our nation are increasingly opposed to the church. Jesus told us that this would happen. John 15, 20 says, servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, that 
all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. We can feel that happening in our culture. We can feel that coming to pass. We certainly haven't experienced it at the level of many nations throughout the world. But we can feel the heat of persecution turning up in our nation, can't we? This shouldn't surprise us. The scripture told us this would happen. I, I, I saw a picture on social media earlier this week, and it said, it's probably time to start, stop talking about the blizzard of 78, because 2020 definitely has that beat by now. This year, I think, if we're being honest, has made a lot of us weary. And I think it can be tempting to just sort of throw in the towel in the midst of all of it. We could just say, I quit. I'm not doing it anymore. But my question today is, is that what God wants? Or perhaps, does he have a purpose for us in all of this? What is he trying to say to his church in this moment in time? Would you take your Bibles, if you have them, and open to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And here in Hebrews, and uh, there's much debate about who the author of Hebrews is. The truth is we don't really know who it is. Some would say it's the Apostle Paul. Others would have different opinions, but we don't know. And here in Hebrews, the author is going to give some instruction to the church. And in particular, he's going to give instruction to those people, maybe you're here today and this is you, who are trending towards growing weary. And to those who are tempted to just give up. And today, as the voice of the world shouts at us that weariness and quitting is our best option I believe that the word of God, that God is saying to us today that that is not the best option. That's what the word of God is going to tell us today, that weariness and quitting is not what he wants of us. And I think our hearts need to hear what the scriptures have to say today. Amen? So the author of the book of Hebrews writes this. Would you look at verse 1 with me? Y'all there? He says this. Therefore... Since we are encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside some of the weight. Nope. Doesn't say some of the weight, does it? It said, let us lay aside every weight. Would you say every weight? And the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with what? endurance the race that is set before us let us look to jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated right now at the right hand of the throne of god for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become what lest you become weary and your hearts do what up lest you become weary and your hearts give up from this text this morning i want to draw out five steps that prevent us from growing weary in the faith and just quitting but before we get into those i want to give you the context in which we find this passage of scripture verse one you see starts with the word therefore it says, therefore, since we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. So that means that what he's about to say in chapter 12 is said in light of what he said before in chapter 11. He refers to a great cloud of witnesses. What is he talking about there? Well, in Hebrews 11, and I'll summarize, we see a list of what many call the great heroes of the faith. We see the examples of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua is alluded to in verse 30. Rahab is mentioned, Gideon, Barak, Samson, 
Jephthah, Daniel, Samuel, and the prophets. All of these are imperfect people who the Bible says had great faith for varying reasons. But I particularly love how this passage closes. And so I want to back up in our Bibles to the previous chapter for a moment. And would you look at verse 33 with me? It says, speaking of these ones, these people of faith throughout the Old Testament, it says, through faith they subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promise, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in fighting, and turned the armies of the foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and did not accept the deliverance so that they might obtain a better resurrection." Still others had trials of mocking and scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins while destitute, afflicted, and tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Yet these all have obtained a good report through faith. But they did not receive the promise. Speaking of the Old Testament saints, look at verse 40. Don't miss this, church. God has provided something better for us so that with us they would be made perfect. You see, the great cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here accomplished all of these things by faith. Faith in God, faith in the midst of any circumstance. I can't think of many other circumstances beyond what we just read there. They had faith. They trusted in God no matter what. Is that us, church? And it says that God has given us something better than they had. You see, we have the promise, church, They had faith not seeing Jesus come to earth yet. They had the books of the prophets that said when Messiah would come. But you see, church, we have the promise. We have something better. We've seen the historical Jesus who set foot on this earth. We're going to celebrate him on Christmas. Jesus came to live among us. We have seen the fulfilled promise of the Savior Jesus who walked this earth. We've received the deposit of the Holy Spirit in us. God dwells in us as his church, as as his sons and daughters. God dwells in us. They They had faith in who would come. We have seen he that has come. His name is Jesus. So in seeing all the examples of the faith and knowing that we have more than they did, the writer of Hebrews is saying here, since we have more than they did, we should act on what he's going to tell us. We should take action on these five steps that prevent us from growing weary and quitting. So what is it that prevents us from growing weary and quitting? We see at least five steps listed here. I'm going to give you five today. Verse 1 of chapter 12 again says, Therefore, since we are encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Here in verse 1, we begin to see a visual develop of a person running a race. And church, we run the race of faith in Jesus Christ. It's much harder to run a race with a tremendous weight strapped to your body. We need to lay aside every weight. David Guzik comments on this passage and he says, sin can hold us back 
But there are also things that may not be sin. Every weight. But are merely hindrances that can keep us from running effectively the race that God has set before us. You see, the idea here is that we must set aside anything that holds us back from faith in Jesus, anything that takes our eyes off our Messiah, anything that slows our progress in becoming more Christ-like. That's the goal of the faith, to live like Jesus lived. Are we experiencing growth towards that goal in our life? When we look back, On when we chimed in 2020, can we say that I've grown to be more like Jesus through all that we've endured this year? This is not the time, church, to take a break in this race. This isn't a pit stop. It's time to run. To run effectively, we've got to lay aside those burdens. We've got to learn to cast them on Jesus. The apostle Peter implored the church. He said this, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast All, say all, church. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Do you understand that he cares for you today? Online, do you understand that he cares for you today? He cares for you. How are we doing with giving our burdens to Jesus this year? are we doing at that perhaps this year in all of this he's trying to teach us to give our worries our cares our burdens to him are we learning that lesson when we're unable to bear the load the god of the universe offers to carry some of the weight for us he offers to carry all the weight for us actually he says this Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You need rest today? Jesus can give you rest. We need to give him the burdens. We need to do that in prayer. I think as a church, we could be better about unburdening. Unburdening comes from a deep prayer life. In prayer, we cast all our cares on him. And I'm mindful of the old hymn that says, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Are we doing it unburdening today? Do we see the privilege it is to come to him in prayer? In the race of faith, it's easier to run when we're not carrying a bunch of stuff with us. Yet all too often, we, I think, carry burdens that Jesus wants to leave us to leave behind. Practically speaking, I wonder if some of us tend to focus so much on what we can't control that we miss the opportunities that are right in front of us. This year is wild, right? COVID-19, riots, civil unrest, who the next president's going to be? You got something to add to the list? We don't have all that much control over that stuff, do we? Where we can have an impact is in our homes. As we grow in our Christ likeness, in, in our marriage, in our relationships with our children, in our church family, in reaching a lost world. It's not that the other things aren't important. But the question is, are we focusing on the areas mostly where we can have the most powerful influence? I think it would be a shame if we focus so much on things we can't control that we neglect those other duties to lead our families, our children, those in our circle of influence. Maybe the the kid in the church that needs a father figure or a mother figure. Generations, church, generations depend on how we react to this moment. 
The world is experiencing profound challenges right now. I get it. It's hard. But the question is, are we unburdening those things to Christ? And then allowing our focus to be knowing him and making him known. The race is far more easily run when we let Jesus carry the burdens. How are we doing with that, church? Second, we lay aside sin. Verse 1 again. Therefore, since we're encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangled us during the last nine to ten months. We've seen alarming spikes in the consumption of alcohol, the use of pornography, and many other destructive things that bring people's lives to ruin. The world that we are living in with so many people spending much time alone increases temptations for these sort of things. So here the author of Hebrews is saying to the church, if you want to be, avoid being, growing weary and being tempted to quit, we got to lay aside the sin. Why? Because it holds us back from God's purposes for our lives. It prevents our growth into Christ's likeness. This church is an invitation to sanctification. Sanctification is the process in the life of a believer becoming more like Jesus. This means to be set apart from the world unto Christ for his purposes. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. And while we realize that none of us will live perfectly like Jesus did, that's what we strive for, amen? amen. He said this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, be ye holy as I am holy. That's the call. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in us that enables us to walk as Jesus walked. The power of the Holy Spirit in us enables us to see victory over sin if we'll let him do his work. So sin hinders our progress in this race. Paul in Romans 8 says that we should, through the power of the Holy Spirit, mortify the deeds of the flesh. That means to kill them by neglect. So when we suffer temptation, when we're tempted to do something that we shouldn't do, we neglect that. We say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm free from that. The Holy Spirit gives me victory over that. How are we doing at neglecting the sin that tempts us during this unique time in history? To avoid becoming weary and tired, we must allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts to put sin to death. We must resist temptation. But we have this promise, when we fail, and sometimes we all will, we have this promise from John 1, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad for that promise today, church? But let's strive for Christ's likeness. Let's let the Holy Spirit unburden us from that sin. That's how we prevent from growing weary and tired. Third, we need to run with endurance. It says, let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us, I think it's interesting here that we're to run with endurance the race that's set before us. Each of us has a calling. Each of us has a search circle of influence. Each of us has specific spiritual gifting that the Holy Spirit has deposited in you if you believe in Jesus. And he wants you to accomplish something for the kingdom of God with that. You see, each of us has a race to run. I've thought a lot this year about the words of young Esther in the Bible. 
She lived in the midst of tremendously trying times. And her conclusion in all of it was, perhaps I've been sent here in this moment, in this time, in this place, for such a time as this. Maybe God put me here. Maybe God put you here. Maybe God put us here. And he wants us to do something with the place he's put us. Amen? Is that our heart when we're confused and taken aback by all that's happening around us? Do we seek to be who God has called us to be in this time? Or do we grumble and complain because we're called to live here and now? It's easy to run a race of endurance without a bunch of weight strapped on you. We must let Jesus remove the weight. We must let him unburden us. We must cast our cares on him. We must let the Holy Spirit deal with the sin. And then we run. And we don't stop. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, do you not know that all those who run in a race run? but one receives the prize. And then he says this, so run that you might obtain it. So run that you might obtain it. We run to win the race. We want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in. I'm, I'm happy with what you did for me. I'm glad you took what I deposited in you and you spread that to those around you. You did something with what I put in you. So run that you might obtain it. It's impossible to do that with all the burdens on us. With the burdens, we can only walk the race of faith. Or maybe we're taking a nap in the race of faith. Or maybe we're quitting. But Jesus wants us to run. This is his word, church. He says, run with endurance. How are we doing? Are we willing to do what it takes, no matter what is around the corner in the coming year, to unload the burdens, to unload the sin, so that we can run? To avoid becoming weary and to prevent us from giving up, we need to run. Fourth, we need to look to Jesus. We look to him in our world today when 10,000 voices cry out for our attention. Do we sometimes tune out the only voice that really ultimately matters? Do we tune out the voice of Jesus? Do we let all the other voices drown out the voice of Jesus. Church, Jesus has all the wisdom. He has all the strength. He controls all things. He's on the throne no matter what happens. He understands everything. He knows what's best for you and he knows what's best for me. And while I think many of us know that in our, our minds, I wonder if we really understand that in our hearts sometimes. I think if that truth that Jesus is on the throne, that Jesus reigns, that Jesus has your best interest at heart, if that really impacted us, many of us would probably be praying differently. We'd probably freak out less about things. I think if we understood that truth more deeply, our communion with God would be a first priority rather than a last resort. We need to look to Jesus, church, particularly in our time. I ask, what voices are we listening to? Is it Jesus? Is it Fox News? CNN? Is it Facebook? Twitter? Is it the push notifications on your phone? Is it... W-E-E-I sports talk? Is it Donald Trump? Is it Joe Biden? Mike Pence? Kamala Harris? Whose voice are we hearing the most? To whom do we give our primary attention? I find that where I devote the most of my time 
That's the voice that resounds the loudest in my mind. Where are we devoting the most of our time? And I would argue that this is the same for all of us, that where we spend the most of our time is what voice is the loudest in our minds, in our hearts. Jesus' voice is the voice that matters the most. The word of God is the voice that matters the most. This isn't to say that being informed is not important. It is. This isn't to say that we can't hear other things, but think about that definition of focus again. A central point, a point of concentration. Early navigators who took to the open waters used the fixed point of the North Star to navigate their waters at night. They knew that finding that fixed point and using that to direct themselves would bring them back home or to where they were going. They focused on that. That was their point of concentration. Does that mean that they didn't see other things that were happening around them? No, but they made that North Star their central point. That was their point of concentration. And church, that's what we need in our life right now, a fixed point. Everything around us seems unfixed lately. But Jesus is never changing. Jesus is our fixed point. Jesus gives us direction. Jesus will bring us back home, amen. When we grow weary, when we want to quit, we need that central point to anchor our direction. And it's right here. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We must focus on him. We must focus on Jesus. And when we do, we'll be able to run the race more effectively. Fifth and finally, to prevent ourselves from growing weary and quitting the race, we need to follow Jesus' example. Verse two says, let us look to Jesus, the author finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary in your hearts and give up. Church, Jesus didn't quit. The writer of Hebrews says, consider him to prevent yourselves from growing weary and giving up. Consider him. Think about Jesus. Contemplate his example. What is Jesus' example, church? He endured suffering for others. He put others before himself, even when it took him to a cross. Even when he was brutally murdered. Why? Because he had joy set before him. He endured a dark world and sinners that the writer here says were hostile against him because of the joy that was set before him. Church, the joy was relationship with you and with me. And with that set before him, it fueled him to endure shame and hostility. Church, we're encouraged to follow his example in this, to endure shame and hostility, to have that joy set before us. Our goal, church, is seeing sinners saved and brought into relationship with the heavenly Father that we know and love. You see, it brings joy to see people following Jesus. We need to have his heart. We saw 17 people go through the waters of baptism last week. That's joy. That should motivate us. That should help us to prevent us from growing weary and quitting. It brings joy when we think about those who mock slander and come against us being with us to worship Jesus for eternity. This passage, church, is a call to have an eternal mindset. We'll win this race by having an eternal mindset. The joy that was set before Jesus 
motivated him through everything he endured. An eternal mindset, love for those who hate us, motivation of seeing even our enemies worship beside us in heaven for eternity. This is what we need in our time. This church, striving to be like Jesus, will prevent us from growing weary and giving up. Verse 2 says that Jesus despised the shame. What does that mean? I love what John Piper writes in response to this question. He says this. Shame was stripping away every earthly support that Jesus had. His friends gave way in shaming abandonment. You been there? His reputation gave way in shaming mockery. His decency gave way in shaming nakedness. His comfort gave way in shaming torture. His glorious dignity gave way to the utterly undignified, degrading refluxes of grunting and scroning and screeching. screeching. And he despised it. What does that mean? It means Jesus spoke to shame like this. Listen to me, shame. Do you see that joy in front of me? Compared to that, you're less than nothing. You're not worth comparing to that. I despise you. You think you have power. Compared to the joy before me, you have none. Joy, joy, joy. That is my power. Not you, shame. You're worthless. You're powerless. You think you can distract me. I won't even look at you. I have joy set before me. Why would I look at you? You're ugly and despicable and you are almost finished. You cover me now as with a shroud. Before you can say so there, I will throw you off like a filthy rag. I will put on my royal robe. You think you're great because even last night you made my disciples run away. You're a fool, shame. You're a despicable fool. That abandonment, that loneliness, this cross, these tools of yours, they are all of my sacred suffering. And will save my disciples, not destroy them. You're a fool, shame. Your filthy hands fulfill holy prophecy. For farewell, shame. It is finished. Church, the worship team and I were praying before and I feel like the Spirit is just prompting me to say this. When Jesus said it is finished, I think as the church we look at that as, and it is this, for the whole world it is finished. Sin is defeated, sin is broken. But it's finished for your sin individually. It's finished in your life. He's broken the bondage of sin in your life and for the whole world. Church, he despised the shame because of the joy that was set before him, because victory was coming as he hung on that cross. What joy was coming? The joy of saving you, the joy of relationship with you and with me and with those around us and with our enemies if they'll repent and turn towards him. Heaven is gonna be filled with Jesus' former enemies. And I pray by God's grace that I'll see some people that today hate me in heaven beside me. May we have that heart of Jesus that when he was spit upon, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Living like Jesus means we have an eternal mindset that we have that joy of seeing people saved set before us. Laying aside the sin, laying aside the weight, running with endurance, looking to Jesus, following his example. In order to practice these things, we must have an eternal outlook. We must remember heaven. We must remember eternity. We must remember that joy set before us. And when we do, we realize that these 80 years, if we're so lucky, are just a small part of what our true life will look like in him, amen? Eternity is coming. It's made secure through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's made secure through his resurrection. 
And church, it's these things that prevent us from growing weary and wanting to quit. Letting Jesus take the weight, laying aside the sin, running with endurance, like Paul said, to win the race, looking to Jesus, living like Jesus. And the central question between all, behind all of those issues is, where's our focus? Where's your focus? Where's my focus? What's the central point in our life? What's our point of concentration? If it's Jesus, we'll endure, we'll run, we'll finish this race. And if it's anything else, we're at risk to grow weary. We might just even want to quit. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, we want to receive your word today. We want to be the church that you called us to be. Your word says that you're setting apart for yourself a pure and spotless bride. We want to be ready for your return, God. And I pray for your church today, God, that these things that we've talked about, these ways that we make sure that we can endure in this race, God, that we take them to heart. We practice them. We never give up in this race, God, but that we'd look to you as the one who ran it perfectly. Maybe you're here today and you just feel the weight of the world on you today. Maybe this year you just feel so burdened. Maybe you just wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to go forward with this day. I want you to know that as we studied in the scriptures today, Jesus can lift any burden in your life. You know, the Bible says that sin burdens us. Sin weighs us down, and it says that the due penalty for sin is death. But Jesus took that upon himself. He died on a cross so that you can be freed from your burdens. He rose again and he, uh, on the third day and he offers to free you from all of that. But he says you have to place your faith in him to be freed from those burdens. So I ask today, maybe you've never met Jesus. Maybe you've never prayed and asked him to be your Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity today. If that's you and you're here, you never place your faith in Jesus, you're fe feeling weighed down and you want to be free today, I ask, would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you today. Matthew 11 says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Jesus says, come to me today. I'll give a moment. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, the fact that you empower us to run this race. You have given us instruction in your word to run this race effectively. I pray, God, that you would use us mightily for your kingdom in this time, that you know we'd realize that we were sent to be here in this time, to make an impact in this time. And whatever we need to lay aside today, sin, weight, troubledness, God, um, fear, that we just lay that at the cross today, that we'd spend some time in prayer today and just surrender those things to you. I pray that as we fellowship together, we'd uplift one another, that you'd bless the food as it's served in the back, God, our time you know, having conversation with one another, help it be encouragement, encouraging and uplifting. I pray that you'd bless the offering as it's given in the box in the back. Expand it for the use of your kingdom, God. Help us reach many, many people with it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go and be blessed, church. Say hello to somebody on your way out. 
Hey, this is Pastor Dave. I'm the lead pastor of Christian Life Fellowship Church. Thanks so much for watching the broadcast. It's very important to us to uphold the scriptures. In the world we live in today, it seems that everybody is compromising the word of God. At Christian Life Fellowship, we're simply not willing to do that. If you appreciate that, there's a way you can help us. Like everything, it takes resources to do this broadcast. If you would like to help us, that would be great. You can click the link right below on your screen. I want you to know that if you can't help us, we still are thrilled that you're watching and hope that it blesses you every week. So join us next week at the same time to hear the word of God without filters. That's what we need, all of us. God bless you in Jesus' name. I'll see you next week. Amen.